Consider many of the most prominent advances for the cause of morality and justice in the history of the United States. The abolition of slavery, securing the right to vote for women and African Americans, and ending the previously common practice of child labor. Each of these are among the most obvious examples along with many others we could mention. When we think back on these historical advances from our contemporary perspective, there is something we may notice. The standards of the past seem to us now not just to be wrong, but to be obviously wrong, to be abhorrent, even to be an offense to human dignity. From the perspective of today, it seems unconscionable that it would be acceptable for one human being to own another. The idea that someone would be denied the right to political participation merely on the basis of their race or sex seems now confused and irrational. Of course, before we pat ourselves on the back, we should also think about what future generations may think about our current ethical standards. For example, might future generations think our willingness to mistreat, slaughter, and eat millions of non-human animals is obviously misguided and morally repugnant? While many of the standards of the past now seem to us to be obviously wrong, it is important to remember that this was not so obvious to those living at the time. At the time, it was very much an open question whether it was always wrong for one human being to own another. It was very much an open question whether the right to vote should only be wielded by white property-owning males. Even a philosopher as perceptive and intelligent as Aristotle famously held that some human beings were natural slaves who were not fit to rule themselves. But how can this be? How can it be that what we now take to be a matter of ethical common sense was not seen in that light in previous times? Or, to put the question another way, why is it that over time there is a tendency for political rights and moral consideration to be granted to a wider swath of people? Why does the general trend of history seem to be one in which there is a slow, painful, and winding, but very real march toward justice, equality, and a more cosmopolitan ethic? In this video, we will continue our exploration of the movement toward moral cosmopolitanism, which we began in the last video. After further exploring the limited form of altruism that evolution equips us with, and seeing some of the practical outcomes of that limited altruism, we will consider what resources human nature has at its disposal to move past this primitive form of morality. What is it about the human being as a sociable and rational creature that allows us to gradually expand the circle of morality? In the previous video, I identified two questions we need to answer in order to adequately address the topic at hand. First, we need to know how closely our human evolutionary morality approximates a cosmopolitan ethic. How close or far away is the morality provided to us by nature to an ethic of universal moral consideration? Second, given that there is some distance between these two ethics, what needs to be done to make our moral thinking more cosmopolitan? On its face, it may seem that evolution gives us a sense of morality that is far from enlightened or cosmopolitan. Consider Charles Darwin's own characterization of the evolutionary process that he gives in The Origin of Species. Darwin states that as many more individuals of each species are born that can possibly survive, and as consequently there is a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary however slightly in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected. The crucial portion of this passage is that Darwin describes the evolutionary process as a struggle for existence. If that is the case, then it would only make sense that ideas like concern for human suffering and universal human rights would not be natural to the human species or any animal species for that matter. However, in order to give proper context to the view of human nature that we get from evolutionary theory, 
and to help us understand the significance of the claim that species arrive from a struggle for existence, I want to briefly look at the view of human nature given by two philosophers who predated Darwin and his work on evolution. These philosophers are Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes. Let's begin with the view of the 18th century French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Newton suggests that once we understand the way in which human nature has arisen through an evolutionary process, that we should shed any illusions we may have had that humans are naturally good or innocent, and need only protection from evil influences to live good moral lives and complete freedom. Furthermore, she tells us that this is a view that Rousseau might have espoused. So our question is, what would have made Rousseau think this? Why would Rousseau think that naturally the human species is good and that evil or bad influences or bad behavior are really just the product of something outside of us, something artificial? Here we are going to take a look at a few passages that encapsulate the core of his argument. In part, Rousseau thought this because he believed the primitive human being, the human as we would have found him or her prior to living in civil society under organized government, he believed that primitive human being to be relatively self-sufficient with few desires that could be easily satisfied. In the Discourse on Inequality, Rousseau tells us that in all, the human being is the most advantageously organized of all animals. I see him satisfying his hunger under an oak tree, quenching his thirst at the first stream, finding his bed at the foot of the same tree that supplied his meal, and thus all his needs are satisfied. Accustomed from childhood to inclement weather and the rigors of the seasons, acclimated to fatigue and forced naked and without arms to defend their lives and their prey against other ferocious beasts, or to escape them by taking flight, men develop a robust and nearly unalterable temperament. The desires of the primitive human are simple and thus easily satisfied. When thirsty, he drinks from a stream. When tired, he sleeps at the foot of a tree. Even the difficulties presented by harsh weather, natural conditions, and predatory animals are things that the primitive human has become accustomed to and has been dealing with since childhood. The means the primitive human has at his disposal to satisfy his, his desires are slim, but fortunately the desires of the primitive human do not require anything more. Rousseau explains that the primitive human's imagination depicts nothing to him. His heart asks nothing of him. His modest needs are so easily found at hand, and he is so far from the degree of knowledge necessary to make him desire to acquire greater knowledge that he can have neither foresight nor curiosity. Primitive humans lacked the ability to pursue higher goods such as knowledge and beauty, but the desire for such things would never have occurred to the primitive human in the first place. The critical point here is that in Rousseau's understanding of human nature, the primitive human can satisfy her desires without infringing on others or preventing others from getting what they want. There will be plenty of streams to drink from, trees to sleep under, and fruit to pick, so that nobody will need to go hungry or thirsty or without shelter. As Rousseau puts it, in our natural condition, the concern for our self-preservation is the least prejudicial to that of others. Now, because this is the case, Rousseau envisions the primitive state of humanity as one largely characterized by peace and tranquility. He tells us that the state of nature was the most appropriate for peace and the best suited to the human race. What is significant about this view is that it puts Rousseau in direct opposition to the position taken by the philosopher Thomas Hobbes. You might remember that in a previous video, we saw that for Hobbes, the state of nature was characterized by unrest and violence. Because human beings are fundamentally self-interested, and do not just naturally desire the means for basic survival, but also have natural desires for things like reputation and glory? Because that is the case, Hobbes held that without the force of government, we are inevitably led into fierce competition and conflict. As Hobbes famously states, life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. For Hobbes, it is the misery of our natural condition 
and the fact that it inevitably devolves into a state of war that motivates us to establish government and enter civil society. Rousseau, however, believes that Hobbes had it precisely backwards. Rousseau tells us that Hobbes' basic mistake was thinking that the primitive human's concern for self-preservation included the need to satisfy a multitude of passions that are the product of society and have made laws necessary. The emotions of resentment, jealousy, and a desire for reputation are not, like Hobbes thinks, an innate part of human nature that drives us into conflict with one another a conflict which ultimately necessitates the establishment of government and organized society. Rather, resentment, jealousy, and a desire for reputation are the product of civil society. It is because we live in society together with rules that, de that designate rights and property holdings that we feel these emotions in the first place. In other words, society is just as much a cause of conflict as it is a remedy for it. The fundamental reason for this is that, unlike in the state of nature, in civil society there are many desires we have that we can only satisfy if someone else does not get what they want. The most obvious example here might be the desire for a particular form of employment and all the economic benefits that go along with it. If there's only one position available, then that means for someone to be the one who gets the job necessarily means that others will not get the job and consequently will not get the economic benefit, prestige, power, and influence that goes along with it. Or to take another example, for me to own a house necessarily means that someone else cannot have that house. They cannot have that plot of land. Living together in society causes us to desire many things that cannot be held by all. And it causes us to want certain things that give us a certain status or power over other people. In such a situation, how could it not be the case that we will feel resentment, jealousy, the desire for status and reputation, and even shame when we do not have as much as others or when we have not been honored as they have? For Rousseau, then, the natural condition of the human being is simple, it is peaceful, and it is contented. And it is a tranquil existence that is ultimately ruined by the ample opportunities that civil society provides for competition and conflict with one another. We have, then, two competing views of human nature. On the one hand, there is the view of Thomas Hobbes, which holds that human beings are naturally only concerned about themselves, have an innate desire to gain status over others, and that prior to the laws and social conventions that constitute civil society, human beings lived a life of constant conflict that was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. On the other hand, there is Rousseau's view that prior to civil society, humans lived a peaceful life that was the most appropriate for peace and the best suited for the human race. Competition is only a byproduct of our social living arrangements. And what follows, we will seek to understand the view of human nature that we get from evolutionary psychology, a conception which, as we will see, situates itself in between the historical precedents of both Hobbes and Rousseau. Our contemporary understanding of evolution shows us that both Hobbes and Rousseau were incorrect in their view of human nature. Or, perhaps, it is better to state that each was only half correct. It is not true to say that human beings are thoroughly selfish animals, incapable of real concern for others. Neither is it true to think that our natural condition is one where our basic needs are easily satisfied and that we have no thought of competing with others to get what we want. Each of these views is, at best, an incomplete story. Our human nature both drives us into competition and conflict, as well as giving us the capacity for a limited but real altru altruistic concern for other people. Given our evolutionary origins, it is not difficult to explain our tendency to engage in competition with others to secure our survival needs. Needs that were really much harder to come by than Rousseau's rather romantic vision of past events would suggest. 
As we saw previously, Darwin described the evolutionary process as a struggle for existence. It is only natural that such a struggle would produce beings that are somewhat self-interested and disposed toward conflict when necessary. It is much more difficult, however, to explain how altruistic care for other people, even in its limited form, arises from the evolutionary process. If evolution really is a struggle for survival, then why do we care about others as much as we do? Why do we make sacrifices for the sake of others? Why don't we care only about ourselves? The philosopher Peter Singer poses this question in his book entitled The Expanding Circle. Singer states, Altruism intrigues sociobiologists. It is a problem because it has to be accounted for within a framework of Darwin's theory of evolution. If evolution was a struggle for survival, why hasn't it ruthlessly eliminated altruists, who seem to increase another's prospects for survival at the cost of their own? Only the most extreme psychological egoist would deny that we have some real concern for other people. But where does this tendency come from? And is it possible to give an evolutionary explanation of it? Singer goes on to describe three different common explanations that evolutionary biologists have offered for the origin of altruism. The first of these is called kin altruism, and it is based on the evolutionary advantage that arises from caring for one's children. Because the survival of one's genes depends primarily upon the survival of our children, there is an obvious evolutionary gain to be had from protecting and caring for our kin. While, as Singer points out, we often do not think of this as altruism because it's so widespread and so natural, it is still one of the clearest examples of a human being making a significant sacrifice of time and energy for the sake of another person. There is also reciprocal altruism. Singer gives the following example of this in the animal world. He says, Monkeys spend a lot of their time grooming each other, removing parasites from those awkward places a monkey cannot itself reach. Monkeys grooming each other are not always related. Here, reciprocal altruism offers an explanation. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. The willingness to cooperate with others and perform actions that serve the interests of others would be advantageous if it increased the likelihood that others would do the same for us in the future. This fact would explain why human beings are often willing to assist those in our own broader community. As Singer mentions, reciprocal altruism will be the most prevalent, quote, in species with a relatively long lifespan living in small, stable groups because opportunities for repeated reciprocal acts would occur more frequently. And of course, this is a description that does fit the human species. So, it pays to be generous and cooperative with those we will often come into contact with. Finally, there's group selection. While the hypothesis of group selection is somewhat more controversial among evolutionary bi biologists, Singer argues that if we do allow some role for group selection, then we get a further basis for altruism. The idea here is that in many cases, the survival of the individual will be very much dependent upon the survival of the group of which that individual is a part. When that is the case, then Singer explains that evolution will favor those who make sacrifices for the sake of the group. Whether it comes from the evolutionary advantage gained from our children surviving, from reciprocal acts of generosity coming from our peers, or just the survival of our group, we can see that there is an evolutionary basis for altruism. However, the most important point for the present topic is to notice the way in which these forms of altruism are limited. The fact that we naturally care for our children does not mean that we will have such concern for those we are not related to. The fact that it is advantageous to cooperate with our peers does not mean the same advantage is to be had from being generous to strangers. And the reasons that move us to sacrifice for our own group may actually motivate us to act violently toward those in other groups. As Singer explains, group altruism would work best when coupled with a degree of hostility to outsiders. 
Many social animals, from ants through chickens to rats, will attack and often kill outsiders placed in their midst. We can still see the unfortunate echoes of this fact in human behavior today. Suspicion of foreigners and those who are different, as well as violence toward ethnic, racial, and religious minorities, all sadly have deep evolutionary roots in human nature. Such behavior seems to be a direct manifestation of the fact that our ability to cooperate with and care for others is real, but also severely circumscribed. Unfortunately, it can be rather easy to demonize and be hostile toward those who are outside the somewhat rather narrow scope of our natural moral concern. Newton also emphasizes how our evolved human nature instills in us natural dispositions that are prejudicial, discriminatory, and harmful to others. In a previously discussed example, she mentions that male lions will challenge the leader of a pride for dominance, and if successful, that lion will go on to kill all the lion cubs in the pride. Now, this seemingly murderous behavior has an evolutionary explanation and that those lion cubs are not genetically related to them, and as such, keeping them alive will only detract from resources that could be used to care for his own young. Here we see a perfect example of the darker side of kin altruism. The same tendency that makes animals care deeply for their own young makes them callous and even hostile toward the young of others. Newton makes a further point that because human nature was also shaped by evolution, we should expect to find something similar in human beings as well. Newton explains that we know that all mammals are closely related on the evolutionary tree. Does that mean that human stepfathers and possibly stepmothers, whether or not they act on them, will have inclinations to abuse or get rid of their adopted children? Yes. Our fairy tales are full of wicked stepfathers and wicked stepmothers who do just that. Here Newton is referring to what is known as the Cinderella effect, a phenomenon in evolutionary psychology that was most prominently explained and defended by Martin Daly and Marco Wilson. In a paper of theirs entitled, Is the Cinderella Effect Controversial?, they provide the following explanation. They state, the phenomenon at issue is parental discrimination against stepchildren relative to how parents treat their birth children. It is manifest both in, re in reduced levels of investment in stepchildren and in elevated rates of mistreatment up to the extreme of lethal abuse. The Cinderella effect refers to the greater likelihood of parental abuse or mistreatment towards stepchildren as compared to biological children. Daly and Wilson point out, as Newton mentioned as well, that this phenomena is commonly portrayed in folklore and the pervasive negative stereotyping of step-parents. Further, they argue that the reason this phenomenon has not received the attention it deserves is because the imaginations of child abuse researchers seem to be uninformed by Darwinism. Yet, despite the discomfort this topic brings about, Daly and Wilson argue that there is plenty of evidence for it. They state that when we conducted the first comparison of abuse rates in step families versus intact birth families, the difference turned out to be large. Abundant confirmatory research has followed such that the disproportionate victimization of stepchildren is now the most extensively documented generalization in the family violence literature. Of course, none of this denies that there are many excellent, wonderful, and caring step-parents. The claim here is about broader statistical trends and probabilities rather than any particular individual. Furthermore, it should be said that Daly and Wilson's claims about the Cinderella effect are not entirely uncontroversial and have been criticized by some researchers. However, to whatever extent the Cinderella effect exists, we can give a relatively straightforward explanation of it in evolutionary terms. Daly and Wilson explain, Why would a Darwinian hypothesize that stepchildren might be discriminated against? Natural selection favors actions that contribute to the production, well-being, and eventual reproduction of the actor's genetic relatives. 
If the psychological underpinnings of parental care have evolved by natural selection, we may thus anticipate that parental feeling and action will not typically be elicited by just any conspecific juvenile. Instead, care-providing animals may be expected to care selectively for young who are A, their own genetic offspring, and B, able to convert that care into improved prospects for survival and reproduction. Given what we know about kin altruism, parents just will tend to have a stronger motivation to care for their genetically related offspring rather than children not related to them. And the Cinderella effect is just one manifestation of this fact. Obviously, none of this is desirable or something we would want to celebrate about human nature. However, the natural anti-egalitarian, even discriminatory side of human nature that is bequeathed to us by our evolutionary past is something it is important to face if we want to think about how to move closer to a cosmopolitan ethic of equality and respect. We have seen that, to a significant extent, the natural morality instilled in us through the evolutionary process is discriminatory. It is not a morality that prizes the value of equality. Newton makes this further point that, in some sense, the discriminatory response which characterizes our natural morality is actually learned. She tells us that the most primitive reactions we can find are taught. Consider that the amygdala, an almond-shaped set of neurons located deep in the brain's medial temporal lobe, part of the brain's limbic system, shown to play a key role in the processing of emotions linked to fear and pleasure, quote, reliably responds to threatening visual stimuli, such as snakes and faces of outgroup members. Now, we doubt that fear of snakes is genetic or inborn, but the fear of an outgroup recognizable by face cannot possibly be inborn. How would the amygdala possibly know what counts as an outgroup for any given person? So we have an innate tendency to be suspicious of those in the outgroup that we perceive to be a threat, but we can't know innately or naturally what counts as our outgroup or who is included in an outgroup. Therefore, that is something that actually needs to be taught. And Newton continues to explain how this occurs. She states that, our primitive visual recognition of bad and good is learned and at a very early age. The best explanation of such learning is that some emotions, and fear is one of them, are communicated physically and non-verbally. The mother holding the child is frightened by something she sees, and that fear is instantaneously communicated to the child who learns to react the same way. It is important to understand what Newton means when she claims that our suspicious response of outgroup members is taught and learned. The claim here is not necessarily that children are explicitly taught to hate or be hostile to those who are different, although that of course can and does unfortunately happen. The point is that such fearful and discriminatory responses can also be learned in much more subtle ways. That is the idea behind the example of the mother that holds her child tighter when she comes into contact with someone from an outgroup. Fear of outsiders arises from the evolutionary advantage that comes with protecting one's children and is communicated through subtle physical and emotional cues. Newton explains that this process of communication trains the child to feel alarm bell emotions in response to certain external stimuli and events. An alarm bell emotion is one that prevents us from engaging in reasoning. It stops action in its tracks and does not permit discussion. Once the child has, for instance, been taught to fear snakes, she no longer needs to rationally evaluate the risk posed by a snake to her life and well-being. The fear of snakes immediately grips us and prevents us from exercising our higher capacities of reason and rationality. The same holds once we have learned to fear those who are in an outgroup. The fear that is felt upon seeing someone different is not something that is amenable to being changed easily through argument and reason. In order to explain how alarm bell emotions work, researchers Fieri Cushman, Leanne Young, and Joshua Green use the following case. 
We will call this the crying baby case. Imagine that enemy soldiers have taken over your village. They have orders to kill all remaining civilians. You and some of your townspeople sought refuge in the cellar of a large house. Outside, you hear the voices of soldiers who have come to search the house for valuables. Your baby begins to cry loudly. You cover his mouth to block the sound. Now, if you remove your hand from his mouth, his crying will summon the intention of the soldiers who will kill you, your child, and the others hiding out in the cellar. To save yourself and the others, you must smother your child to death. Is it appropriate for you to smother your child in order to save yourself and the other townspeople? Now, we should notice that there are two possible responses here. Either we smother the baby to save the group, or we don't smother the baby. What the researchers found is that those who gave the former response, smother the baby to save the group, did so on the basis of a process of reasoning as to what should be done. They engaged in a calculation of what the long-term consequences of the choice would be. We should notice that there is a real sense in which smothering the baby does seem like the most rational choice, even though to do so would obviously be heart-wrenching and tragic. Notice that even if you do not smother the baby, the baby will still die, but just at the hands of the evil soldiers. On the other hand, those who gave the don't smother the baby response approach the case differently. Those who gave this response did so because of an alarm bell emotion, because of an immediate feeling of disgust or abhorrence about the thought of smothering a baby. Because this was the basis of the decision, their decision could not be changed or swayed on the basis of thinking about the long-term consequences. It was just the very idea of smothering an innocent baby that set off an alarm bell in their head that prevented any further consideration of what should be done. This gives rise to the judgment that there are certain moral absolutes, certain actions that should never be performed no matter their outcome or consequence. Now, if these researchers are correct, then such judgments are based upon certain learned or innate emotional responses that we feel towards some behaviors instead of being based upon a rational consideration of what course of action would be best. Something similar, then, happens when we react with suspicion or hostility toward an outgroup. As Newton explains, this means that, in a sense, racism is one of the first things that children are taught. And again, we can give a perfectly sound evolutionary explanation for why this is the case. Newton tells us that during most of the human being's time on Earth, the 100,000 years preceding the settling of permanent communities, humans were as much prey as predators, and their worst enemies were those of their own species from competing groups. Survival advantage went to those groups who could recognize enemies quickly. Over the long run, the group that is acutely conscious of the distinction between those who are members and those who are not will persist in the future, and the group that is not will not persist into the future. Given the roots that outgroup discrimination has in human evolution, we should not be surprised to see that such attitudes are expressed in some of the oldest human writings we have available to us. Consider, for example, the following passage from the Bible. In Leviticus, it says, If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, do not make them work as slaves. Because the Israelites are my servants whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. Do not rule over them ruthlessly, but fear your God. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life. But you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. Here we see a discriminatory ethic in which it is acceptable to enslave foreigners, but it is not acceptable to enslave one's fellow Israelites. Of course, from a theological and religious point of view, there are many debates as to how this passage and others like it should be understood given that many Jews and Christians believe this to be the inspired word of God. How could God recommend something as abhorrent to slavery? One proposal is that God needed to speak to the people of that time in a language and with concepts that they can understand. Now, our purpose here is not to adjudicate whether that response is sound, 
But what we should notice is that this response really does assume the very point we're making here. For someone living at that time, an equal and discriminatory treatment, even upon the question of enslavement of another human person, would have seemed completely natural. And there are good evolutionary explanations for why that would be the case. Unfortunately, the, the suspicion and hostility toward outgroup members that may have been essential for the survival of our ancestors in the very distant past still persist in human nature to this day, despite the very real advances toward equality that humanity has also made. These tendencies still persist, despite the fact that we now live in modern, multiracial, multi-ethnic civil societies in which suspicion of those who are different no longer has any survival utility. In fact, its tendency is rather destructive and harmful. But if these attitudes have a deep evolutionary basis in human nature, and are based upon alarm bell emotions that are not easily changed by reason, then how can we overcome them? How can we take positive steps toward moral progress? How does a cosmopolitan ethic of equal consideration become established and normalized? While the natural barriers standing in the way of a more cosmopolitan epic are substantial, it is also important not to forget the real advances human beings have made in the cause of equality, justice, and universal moral consideration. Despite the limitations of our evolutionary morality, human beings have made admirable strides in expanding the circle of moral consideration. Peter Singer points out in his book The Expanding Circle, that this gradual historical move toward greater equality, once it is understood within the context of evolutionary psychology, should be seen as a tremendous change. It is tremendous that we have been able to apply the ethic of equal consideration that is first present within our own particular groups and communities to the universal community of all human persons. At minimum, at least, we can understand universal moral consideration as a goal and work to move toward it, even if this aim has yet to be perfectly instantiated and probably never will. Now, what should we think about this historical trend toward a more egalitarian ethics? Singer puts the question in the following way. Greater equality is the direction in which moral thought has been going since ancient times. Is it an accident of history that, th that this should be so? Or is it the direction in which our capacity to reason leads us? In other words, is it merely a happy coincidence that human society has become more equal and just over time? Or is there something about the very nature of reason itself that makes this progress inevitable? It may not be easy for reason to overcome the pull of our fearful and suspicious alarm bell emotions, but perhaps in the long run, reason can enable us to overcome the more primitive ethics that is founded upon our immediate emotional responses. Singer sees moral progress as the result of reason itself. The very structure of reason makes such progress almost inevitable. To explain this point, Singer compares the process of reason to riding an escalator. If we do not understand what an escalator is, Singer argues, we might get on it intending to go a few meters, only to find that once we are on, it is difficult to avoid going all the way to the end. Similarly, once reasoning has got started, it is hard to tell where it will stop. The idea of a disinterested defense of one's conduct emerges because of the social nature of human beings and requirements of group living. But in the thought of reasoning beings, it takes on a logic of its own, which leads to the extension beyond the bounds of the group. The person who does not understand how an escalator works might think he can get on, ride for a few seconds, and then just get off without having to go all the way to the end. But of course, that is not how escalators actually work. Once you are on an escalator, you can only avoid going all the way up with great difficulty and effort. The same is true of the process of reasoning. To see this, imagine one of our distant human ancestors who reasons in the following way for the first time. 
let's imagine that this person says to themselves the following. I know that I do not want to be harmed and mistreated, but wait a second. I am only one person, and I am no more spe special or important than anyone else in my individual tribe. So if it is wrong to harm me and mistreat me, then it must be wrong to harm and mistreat my other tribe members as well. Here this person has stumbled upon an argument for why he should not harm those in his in-group. However, the important point here is that this reason does not only apply within his tribe. It can be extended to include all human beings, in fact, the entire human community. For instance, we might say, if I am no more special or important than any other human being, and it is not acceptable for me to be mistreated, then it would not be acceptable for others to be mistreated either. The end point of this line of reasoning is moral cosmopolitanism. But the human being who first concludes that he should act with fairness and justice toward other members of his group has no idea that this is the case. He has gotten on an escalator, the escalator of reason, and he doesn't realize just how high this escalator is capable of taking the human species. Singer explains this point in the following way. To reason ethically, I have to see my own interests as one among the many interests of those that make up the group, an interest no more important than others. Justifying my actions to the group therefore leads me to take up a perspective from which the fact that I am I and you are you is not important. Within the group, other distinctions are similarly not ethically relevant. That someone is related to me rather than to you or lives in my village among the dozens of villages that make up our community is not an ethical justification for special favoritism and does not allow me to do for my kin or fellow villagers any more than you may do for your kin or your fellow villagers. The next step is to ask why the interests of my society shall be more important than the interests of other societies. If the only answer that can be given is that it is my society, then the ethical mode of reasoning will reject it. If reason does not permit us to give special consideration to ourselves, our village, town, city, state, country, race, or religion, then it is inevitable that the escalator of reason will move our ethics in a more universal direction. The first step is to reject egoism, to reject the idea that my personal interests are more important than the interests of others, or that only my interests matter. However, once we do this, then any basis we have for giving special consideration to our own village or our own community will be undercut. If my interests are no more important than the interests of anyone else in the group, then the interests of someone in my village cannot be any more important than the interests of someone in a different village. In fact, this same idea will undercut any basis for giving any larger society of human beings special consideration over any other society of human beings. If the interests of those in my village have no special importance, then the interests of those in my society will not be any more important than the interests of those in another society. The escalator of reason, then, inevitably justifies a moral point of view where the interests of all human beings matter, and matter equally, no matter what family they were born into, what village they reside in, or what country they claim allegiance to. In fact, the escalator of reason that Singer describes may go even farther than this. Singer wrote one of the foundational texts in the animal rights movement, a book entitled Animal Liberation. In his view, the same escalator of reason that shows that all human beings matter would show that all animals matter as well. In this way, just as sexism or racism can be shown to be irrational, Singer also thinks that speciesism, a prejudice against another on the basis of their species, can also be shown to be irrational. Let's consider the escalator of reason that leads to moral consideration for animals. One way to think about it is to see it as a continuation of the same escalator that demonstrates the irrationality of sexism and racism. In the Declaration of Independence, it is famously stated that all men are created equal. Of course, at the time, that promise was hardly kept. It only really applied to all white property-owning males. However, let's hypothetically take the statement at face value and interpret the word men 
to mean all human males. The basic I idea here is that no individual man is any more important than any other. However, if that is true, then wouldn't reason dictate that women should be granted equal treatment as well? Can't women suffer and be harmed by discrimination and oppression just like men can? So if the interests of any particular man are no more important than the interests of any other particular man, then it should follow that the interests of men in general cannot be any more important than the interests of women. To put the point another way, how can we deny equal consideration to women if we would not deny it to all men? This again is another step on the escalator of reason. But of course, we might say, why stop there? It is quite common, of course, to think that there is a bright dividing line between humans and animals. We kill and eat animals, but we would never think it is acceptable to do that to another human being. Yet for all the real differences between humans and animals, aren't there also critical similarities? Can't animals suffer? Can't animals feel pleasure? Can't animals have lives that go well or go poorly? And doesn't the way the life of an animal goes matter for its overall happiness? If so, then it seems like the following claim is also dictated by reason. If the interests of any particular human, male or female, are no more important than any other human, whether a male or female, then the interests of humans cannot be any more important than the interests of animals. Now, Singer's claims about animals are more controversial. And there are some important differences between humans and animals that he would admit justify differences in treatment. For example, nobody would seriously argue that dogs should be permitted to vote. However, in a society which does systematically kill and eat animals, often subjecting them to horrible treatment prior to death, his concern is more with the baseline lack of equal moral consideration that we give to animals in the first place. And if human suffering matters, then it seems that there can't be any basis for claiming we shouldn't care about animal suffering. If suffering matters when it's the suffering of a human being, then it shouldn't cease to matter merely because that suffering is happening to an animal. From these considerations, we can begin to understand Singer's point about the tendency of reason, a tendency which he describes as being like an escalator. While our natural evolved moral inclinations are rather narrow and even discriminatory, we are also capable of more rational and enlightened moral convictions that give equal weight to the interests of all beings that can suffer and experience happiness. Just as the fact that a person belongs to one country or another is not a legitimate grounds for discrimination, or the fact that someone is a man or a woman is not a legitimate grounds for discrimination, it is also the case that whether a being is human or not is not in itself a legitimate grounds for discrimination or denying equal consideration of interests. All suffering and happiness matters, no matter where that suffering or happiness is found. As such, the escalator of reason should give us hope that our basic capacity for limited altruism can be extended and developed into an ethic in which care for, at minimum, the entire human community is both expected and celebrated.